In today's show, Apple returns to the NAB show, the National Association of Broadcasters, and that could mean a lot for Final Cut. Plus, probably the most iCave answers we've ever done. It's a big show. Let's go. I'm iCave Dave and I simplify Apple so that everything just works for you and if you want the latest Apple news, leaks and rumours every weekday at 12 UTC, like the video, subscribe to the channel and ring that notification bell. I am going for a record every time I do that to see how fast we can do it. Should we go for one more time? I'm iCave Dave and I simplify Apple so that everything just works for you and if you want the latest Apple news, leaks and rumours every weekday at 12 UTC, like this video, subscribe to the channel and ring that notification bell. I'm getting pretty good. But yes, Apple is returning to the NAB show that's October the 9th to the 13th in Las Vegas. Uh, that's this year in 2021. Nearly forgot what year it is. And the dates of this line up quite interestingly with what happens in October. We tend to get our second event of the year. So we're going to get our September event around about the 14th. Then we will have an October event, which may well be happening at about the same time as this. Now, I know everyone was confused when at WWDC, they did not announce pro apps for the iPad Pro. However, I have a feeling that uh, this year around October time, when we get our M1X Max. Please God, let us get the M1X Max. I have a feeling, I have a feeling that Apple is going to release a really overhauled version of Final Cut Pro. I have a feeling that they might even integrate things like live streaming, because that's been quite a big change in the environment since the last major version of Final Cut was released. And Apple does seem to be paying more attention to what's going on in the real world now with things like having the export tools so that you can export from Final Cut uh, with the intelligent uh, crop so you can export to different social media formats. So that could be something that is going to be coming with a live streaming element to Final Cut Pro or maybe could we get a Final Cut companion that is the equivalent of main stage for Logic so that it's more about that live streaming format rather than being all about linear editing. That would be a really interesting thing for Apple to add and I think that would be super successful and I think if Apple could uh, create something like that that works specifically for iPad Pro as well um, that would be, or, or for the iPad in general, for the iPad platform, I think that could be really, really successful. I think they would almost dominate in the live streaming market for anyone that was wanting to use live streaming when they're out and about. This could be a really compelling option. So I think that the M1X Max, when they come, will also uh, be introducing the next generation of Final Cut. This could be when we get our subscription model option um, as opposed to the purchase it outright that we've got right now. Or there could be both options. We just don't know, but it's an interesting time. I think the fact that they're coming back to the NAB and the last time they were at the NAB is when they introduced the 64-bit version of Final Cut Pro, uh, which absolutely blew everyone's minds because at that point you could only have something like four gigs of memory addressable when you have the 32-bit version. The 64-bit version coming out in 2011 was an absolute revelation for people. And let's see what they can do this time. It just makes so much sense that if they're coming back to this show, there's going to be big Final Cut stuff. So next up, we have rumours of an external display. And these are very specific rumours. To me, makes a lot of sense. I'm not sure if this is going to be our lower cost display. But we're hearing rumours of an A13-based chip powering an external display with its own neural engine built in. Um, and this is a very interesting rumour. Now, this could be our low-end uh, product. There's no reason that they couldn't put an A13 into a display and keep the pricing low because we've already got A13 powering the iPhone SE, which is a $400 iPhone, which has got modems in it. It's got touch interfaces. It's got all sorts of stuff, batteries that wouldn't be needed for a display. All you need is a good panel, which we know that Apple already has access to, the A13 to power it. I think that the A13 in there could well be for things like putting the black background blur into FaceTime calls, for doing image signal processing from the included webcam, which almost certainly is going to be there, let's be honest, and it's going to be the 1080p one. So it makes sense in my mind that this might be for a 24-inch one based on the iMac that we have right now. And it could well be as well that this is compatible with existing Intel-powered Macs and bringing a lot of those features that we had video-wise to those Macs. So this could be almost like a docking station that you can plug any MacBook into and you get the abilities of a 1080p webcam that's a lot 
better quality than the one that's built into the MacBooks. Now, there are people talking about it acting like an eGPU. Now, an A13 is not going to be a particularly powerful eGPU, but it's certainly enough to run a display. So I think rather than being an eGPU as we think of it right now, being some full-on graphics card, I think it's going to be more that it can power the display independently so that your internal processor isn't being stretched and also you might not necessarily need to use a full Thunderbolt lane. Now that could mean that uh, the M1 Max that are currently capped on the number of displays that they can use would be able to use one of these and it wouldn't kind of hit their allowance of displays um, because all of the processing could be done on board. That would be an, another interesting way of using it. Uh, we don't know until we see these things. Mac Rumors, uh, Apple Insider, they've all been saying, you know, it could act as its own eGPU. In the past, Apple has experimented with displays that had their own graphics cards inside. Um, I don't think this is exactly that, but kind of augmenting what you've got within your Mac already but I think it's really interesting. We also have a couple of reports from Mark German. So first of all, September's event will once again be digital with a focus on online sales. I think we kind of all assumed this because uh, when the employees don't want to go back to Apple Park right now because they're still worried about pandemic. And also, I guess people just like working from home. You know, it's a really nice atmosphere to be able to work from your desk, wear your jammers. I love it uh, on the days that I get to do it at home. But um, there's a few people that have mentioned, oh, why don't they do a hybrid one where they have a few people in person and then more of a digital event still. But if you're going to have people there in person, then you have to shift back to the onstage version. Um, yes, you're still going to have the highly produced parts, but we've always had that. They're either going to go to an onstage version, regardless of how many people they have in person with the produced segments, or they're going to go full digital, which I think they're going to stick with for a little while. I personally think they should stick with uh, digital events forever because... They're actually better. I think if they were going to make this like a hybrid thing, rather than having everyone come to the Apple campus, they should have multiple sites around the world at flagship Apple stores where um, different journalists can go to get the hands-on stuff that they do after the event. So rather than all going to Cupertino for it, have different hubs. Have a, a London hub, a New York hub, a Paris hub, um, a Chinese hub, things like that, so that the journalists don't have to travel internationally necessarily, but at the main hubs for journalism, they can go and access these devices. Next up, uh, Mark German, and this is a quote. I'd bet that Face ID on a Mac is coming within a couple of years. I expect all iPhones and iPads to transition to Face ID within that time frame too. Now, the fact that German is now saying, I would bet, rather than... I have some sort of information, which is what he's always said in the first place. Mark Gurman always seems to have had information coming directly from Apple, maybe on the down low, maybe on the kind of he's getting it in an official capacity, but off the record. And then he's able to kind of report it in a leak style uh, because it seems like Mark has been able to manage expectations a little bit on Apple's behalf in the past. Um, this seems a lot like he is uh, also struggling in terms of getting information out too. I think we all kind of assume that Face ID will come to everything eventually. Uh, this is not information, Mark Gurman. Sorry, but this is you kind of guessing in the same way that everyone else has had to for years and doesn't really suit you. But there we go. That is the news that we have. We have so many iCave answers coming in from you guys today, which is amazing. But before we do that, a quick update on the iCaveversary event that we're doing the six hour live stream on the 15th of August. Make sure that you note it in your calendars. The live stream is scheduled now, so you should be able to set your reminders. I will put a link up here. Finally, I will actually put that in on the cards and you can click onto it and set a reminder for the event. Um, we are looking to have as many guests as possible. So now that I've published it, it's on Twitter. Head over to Twitter, find your favorite uh, Apple YouTubers and tag me and them in a post saying that you would love to see them on the show, then uh, it doesn't look like I'm just chasing everyone. Um, but if you guys can start helping me out with getting the guests that you want to see on that show, that would be amazing. But let's get into your iCave answers. Ryan Bellinger asks, do you think that the LTPO display will be on the base iPhone 13 models or just on the iPhone 13 Pros? So I think this is going to be reserved for at least the first year for just the Pro models. So those will be the ones that will get the always on displays and the variable refresh rates. Because honestly, Apple needs to keep some features that make the Pros worth getting. Um, 
Apple doesn't care about cannibalizing themselves, so once the technology gets cheap enough that they can put it into everything, I'm sure they will. But I think at least for the first year or so, it will be an exclusive to the Pro's feature, just like the LiDAR is. Um, it looks like the LiDAR is sticking as a Pro feature for this year too, which I've got to say, the autofocus on the Pro's is insane. Uh, that's why I use it for these videos every day. Evan Rogers asks, IK Vances, any chance we see two more things at the iPhone event in September to introduce the MacBook Pro 14 and 16, or will Apple stick to an iPhone, iPad, and accessories format? Great question. Uh, I think they would still count it as one more thing if it was MacBook Pro, because they're not two separate lines. They're one line with different sizes within them. That's like saying introducing Apple Watch as four more things because they've got a cellular and a non-cellular in two different sizes. So I don't think that they would think of it as a two more things. However, I think we're probably going to be looking at October. It makes more sense to separate them out because it's going to be such a big deal. I think that we might well see uh, iPhone, Apple Watch and base iPads, maybe iPad mini in September. And then when we move over to the October event, that's when we'll see Macs. I think we'll see MacBook Pros, Mac mini, possibly um, some new software stuff coming out. I think that might be where they focus on Final Cut with the new power that goes into the M1Xs and also then bringing it to the iPad 2. Thomas Rundle asks, IK Vances, either a glitch or an insight into early production. A serial number checking website suggests that my AirPods were made in 2011. Does this sound weird to you? Sending you a picture on Twitter. So yeah, we got this We got this picture come through. It's from imeicheck.com or something. Um, I think this is just a glitch. I don't think this is anything to do with uh, that. I think possibly these don't even have a proper production date built into them uh, in the firmware. And I think it's just kind of an assumed one maybe a default number that was left in there, but no, they weren't being produced in 2011. Think about what else was coming out in 2011. We were talking about like iPad mini one. We were talking like pre-retina iPads. We just about had the iPhone four. Yeah, we'd only just started getting FaceTime cameras in, in our iPhones back then. Uh, we hadn't got 64-bit ARM chips. We didn't have 64-bit chips in our phones until the uh, 5S, which I think was 2012. So, no, I don't think um, that these were produced anywhere near 2011. There might have been a chip inside that they've used that was produced back then, but the, uh, the product certainly wasn't. I don't think they came out until, what, 2016? Brandon L. asks, I drink answers. Do you have any recommendations for a sweet red wine? Now, it's a difficult one because uh, red wines tend to come more in light and full-bodied rather than sweetness levels. But in terms of if you want a red wine kind of feel, look for things like a port. Um, they tend to be aged a little bit longer. That softens a lot of the harsh edges and the tannins. And you'll find that they, they come across a lot sweeter. Um, but you can search online if you want specific sweet red wines. There are some that are made to be sweeter but they're actually just kind of sweetened after they've been produced. Travis Smith asks, IK Vances, why does Apple sell different iPhone sizes, including 12 mini, 12, 12 Pro, and 12 Max? So this is purely a thing of market. Uh, there's different people that want different phones, and I actually think that Apple was doing the right thing right at the beginning when they made one phone. Um, so you had the iPhone. That was it. When the first iPhone came out, the iPhone 2, uh, or 2G, I think they called it, you had one phone. When the iPhone 3G came out, they had one phone. When the 3GS came out, you had one phone. The 4 came out, one phone, although they finally went, you know what, we're going to do white. Yeah. Um, 4S, black and white, 5, a uh, couple of colours, 5S, a couple of colours. Then it was when we got to the 6 that we got the 6 and the 6 Plus, and everyone lost their minds. Um... And the larger phones, you know, people do want those larger phones. And this is kind of why the iPad mini has kind of lost a little bit of traction over the time, because the bigger phone sizes have started to push towards the size of an iPad mini. Um, because it has the different aspect ratio, it's still thinner in your hand, things like that. But um, the reason that they do them is because they think people want them. And with everything that Apple does, they're trying to create products that people will want to buy. It turns out that not that many people want to buy the Mini, which is strange because everyone had been going on forever that they really, 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 really wanted a smaller phone, and then they didn't buy them. So um, they probably won't be doing a Mini um, again after this year's phones. Uh, it looks like we are going to get, I think when we get to 14, 
or, or at least two generations away, we'll get a 14 and a 14 Plus, and then a 14 Pro and a 14 Pro Max. That's probably what's going to happen. Evan Rogers asks, eventually, will Apple put forth performance cores into an iPhone? When this happens, do you think Apple makes the marketing switch to M series for the iPhone Pro models? No, I don't think they're going to do that in terms of the branding. The iPhone is the iPhone. The A series chips is what they have. Um, I think once we get to putting four performance cores in there, each core is going to be way more efficient. But I don't even know if they're going to need to do that because the performance of the iPhones is still like way beyond what anyone else can do. And those uh, those cores are still going to stay at the cutting edge. You know, we're still probably 18 months ahead of any of the Qualcomm chips right now. Having said that, the guys from uh, Nuvia uh, that used to work at Apple Silicon's um, team have moved over to Nuvia and then Nuvia was bought out by Qualcomm so there might be catching up happening soon we don't know yet. Travis Smith asks why doesn't the Apple TV get new internals every year? Honestly dude I don't know I think it's something that is going to happen I think that as we get into Apple's swing with the Apple Silicon stuff and producing these chips uh, in a more consistent way. I think that's exactly what's going to happen. Now that Apple has the scale of being able to produce um, an A-series chip, an M chip, and then an MX chip within a 12-month window every year, it just makes sense that they will produce uh, mainboards that can take these things and run with it and be able to update them every year, just like they should be able to update the iPhone every year, which they manage, and the iPad, uh, the basic iPad every year, which they manage. Um, I think that everything is going to go to annual updates because it doesn't make sense not to if you've got the chips ready to go. Ryan Ballinger asks, IK Vances, do you think that Apple will release a new consumer end Thunderbolt display? Yeah, we've kind of touched on this. It is on the way with that A13 uh, powered display with its own neural engine that's coming. Uh, we just don't know when yet. Okay, and we've got rapid fire coming from Ivel Keyboard. I think he was trying to put these into the live chat the other day. Guys, if, if I'm not there on the live chat, because sometimes I can't be at the premieres, um, please just put your iCave Answers questions down in the comment section because I will get to them that way. So here we go. iCave Answers. We're going to keep these up on the screen. When are AirPods Pro 2 and AirPods 3 coming out? Now, it looks like we're going to be getting AirPods 3 this September or October. I think they're probably going to go for the same event as the uh, iPhones and the Apple Watches. That makes the most sense to me. Um, in terms of AirPods Pro 2, they look like they've been pushed to next year. Uh, so my guess would be around... April time, March, April, whenever they do the spring event next year. When is Apple Watch Series 7 coming out? That will probably be September. Um, normally, the Apple Watch is pretty regular and comes out in the first event of the fall. When is the iPhone 13 coming out? Also September. I think it's going to be the September 14th is the event date that we're expecting. iPhone SE, when's that coming out? We think that will be the spring event next year. Again, March uh, April time. 12S coming out and iPhone 14 coming out. So 12S slash 13, we don't know the naming of it yet, will be September event, September the 14th, iPhone 14, you got to wait till next year. When are Apple glasses coming out? That's probably going to be our first look at AR or VR, as you're asking about VR as well next. Those will probably be from next year, I would think, is when we'll get our first glimpse of one or the other. MacBook Air M2 coming out. I think this is going to be the spring event next year, April or March. Uh, M1X Mac Mini coming out. I think that's going to be October. M1X MacBook Pros coming out. I think that's going to be October. MacBook SE coming out. I think... We're not even sure if a MacBook SE is going to happen yet. This is my prediction. This is one that I've been talking about. Uh, MacBook SE and Mac Mini SE since probably like November last year, just after we got the first of the um, Apple Silicon stuff coming out. I think MacBook SE most likely is going to be April event if they do it, but we don't know if they're going to call it that or if it's going to be a MacBook Air with M1. We will see what happens on that front. And what is Xloader malware? We've actually done a whole show on this, uh, which probably you didn't watch, uh, but it's about three shows back. Have a look in the catalogue. I will link it up here. But that's it for today's show. Lots of iCave answers. I always love answering these things for you guys. So if you've got any questions, hashtag iCave answers down in the comments section. And we'll see you in the next show.